When you think of the respiratory system, chances are that the first image your mind conjures is either that of your nose or your lungs. After all, the nose is certainly what you notice when someone is snoring next to you, and those with well-conditioned lungs are capable of incredible feats. Singing beautiful works of art. Breaking glass with your voice. And holding your breath for 24 minutes? Seriously? Every time there's an underwater scene in a movie, I end up gasping for air. The point is, our respiratory system is incredible. But did you know it's subdivided into the upper and lower respiratory tracts? The lungs will take a back seat today. Instead, we are going to focus on the function of the upper respiratory tract, as well as how it interacts with both your sinuses and your ears. When you breathe, air is taken initially through the nostrils. The inside of the nose is lined with hair and cilia, tiny structures which serve to trap dirt particles with the assistance of mucus. If these get into the lungs, they can lead to irritation and infection. These particles are then moved towards the front of your nostrils, where they can be sneezed or wiped away in the form of bogies. Divided by the septum, the body has two nasal cavities that are lined with mucous membranes. The nasal cavities are hollow spaces and designed to filter and warm the air, increasing the amount of water vapour present before it passes through into the lungs. Making the air moist and humid is required, as dry air can harm the delicate tissue found in the lungs. To assist in this process, there are three pairs of turbinates, or conche, located along the sides of both nasal cavities. If we look at a sagittal plane cross-section, you can make out these three distinctive grooves here. These folds inside your nose help warm and moisten air after you breathe it in, and also assist with nasal drainage. The lower parts of the nostrils and nasal cavity act as respiratory passages. The upper parts support the olfactory mucous membrane. From here, the olfactory nerve sends signals that allow us to perceive smell. This is the cranial, or C1 nerve, and is the shortest sensory nerve in the body. From the nasal cavity, there are a number of small openings that connect through to the sinuses. Sinuses are hollow spaces found in the bones of your head which can be broken down into four groups. If we look at the skull, we can actually see these small holes and indents, denoting where the sinuses would be. First of all, there are two large frontal sinuses found in the frontal bone, which forms the lower part of the forehead and reaches over the eye sockets and eyebrows. The ethmoid sinuses, also known as the ethmoid cells, are a collection of hollow spaces in the bones around the nose and form these clusters which empty independently into the nasal cavity. The maxillary sinus is similar to the frontal with two large cavities in the maxillary bones of the skull. Finally, the sphenoid sinus is contained within the sphenoid bone and can vary in shape and size between people quite drastically. As you breathe in air through your nose and mouth, it moves through these sinus passages. The sinuses also produce mucus that coats and lubricates your nasal passages as well as the sinuses themselves. Both air and mucus flow through your sinuses and drain into your nose through ostium, tiny openings collectively referred to as ostia. Cilia help the mucus move through the sinus cavities. The mucus from the sinuses drains into your nasal passages and then down the back of your throat to be swallowed. The draining mucus helps keep your nose moist and filters out dust and bacteria. The sinuses have also been linked to altering the cadence of your voice as well as assisting in the moistening of air. Breathing through the mouth is possible but less beneficial and should only typically be done in cases where one can't breathe through the nose either due to allergies 
or infection. Breathing through your nose can help filter out dust and allergens, boost oxygen uptake, and humidify the air breathed in. Mouth breathing, on the other hand, can dry out your mouth, increasing one's risk of bad breath and gum inflammation. Whilst calling someone a mouth breather has become somewhat of a meme, the effects it can have, especially in children, are both real and serious. Research has shown that children who breathe through their mouth excessively can develop jaws incorrectly. The airway does not move forward as it should and becomes compromised. Not only does this have an effect on aesthetics, but can also lead to sleep difficulties, cognitive issues, anxiety, and depression. Air from either the mouth or nose ultimately join at the pharynx, the part of the throat behind the mouth and nasal cavities. The pharynx is approximately five inches in length in the average sized human and can be broken down into three parts. The nasopharynx is the upper part of the throat behind the nose. An opening on each side leads into the ear. The oropharynx is the middle part and where the oral cavity joins. The hypopharynx is the bottom section and where the division between the trachea and the oesophagus occur. The oesophagus continues down into your stomach and leads to the rest of the digestive system whilst the trachea, or windpipe, is a U-shaped tube that connects to your lungs. To prevent food from entering your airways, you have the epiglottis. This is a flap of tissue that sits beneath the tongue at the back of the throat, which closes over the trachea whilst eating. As we are all aware, however, this can, on occasion, not work as intended. Above the trachea and below the epiglottis is the larynx. This is commonly referred to as the voice box, as it contains your vocal cords and is essential to human speech. The vocal cords comprise two bands of smooth muscle tissue. When air passes through the cords, they vibrate, producing the sound of your voice. When the larynx grows larger during puberty, it sticks out at the front of the throat. This is the laryngeal prominence of the thyroid cartilage, what is commonly known as the Adam's apple. Both men and women have an Adam's apple, although it is typically more pronounced in men. As a little test, place your fingers on your Adam's apple and hum a tune, first in a low pitch and then in a high pitch. You should be able to feel the thyroid cartilage actually move. The cricothyroid muscle produces tension and elongation of the vocal cords, and it is this process that produces a higher pitched cadence. Moving back up the neck, at both sides of the nasopharynx, there are openings that lead to the left and right eustachian tubes, now more commonly referred to as the pharyngotympanic tubes. These tubes progress to the tympanic cavity, an air-filled hollow space inside the middle ear. The middle ear connects sound waves from the external environment and transfer them to the inner ear for auditory transduction. Small bones, known as the auditory ossicles, the malleus, incus, and stapes, play a key role in this function. The malleus connects to the tympanic membrane, transferring auditory oscillations to the incus and then the stapes. The stapes connects to the oval window, allowing for mechanical energy to be transferred to the fluid-filled inner ear. These sound waves originate at the outer ear in response to vibrations in the air. The outer ear captures these sound waves. The sound then travels down the external auditory canal where it hits the eardrum, clinically referred to as the tympanic membrane. The membrane vibrates, which in turn causes the ossicles of the middle ear to also vibrate. Moving through to the inner ear, we have two main parts, the cochlea, which is the hearing portion, and the semicircular canals, which are the balance portion. The cochlea is this strange spiral-shaped structure. 
If you are as big of a weeb as me, and familiar with Junji Ito's work, particularly that of the horror story Uzumaki, you would be uncomfortably familiar with this structure. For those interested, it is a fantastic story, but certainly not for the faint of heart. Keeping on track, the cochlea is shaped almost like a snail, and is divided into two chambers by a membrane, both of which are filled with fluid. When vibrations are sent through, it causes small hairs along the lining of the membrane to vibrate and send electrical impulses to the brain. The semicircular canals are also known as the labyrinthine. These canals are lined up at right angles, 90 degrees to each other, and allow the brain to know in which direction the head is moving. They are filled with fluid and have some small calcium crystals embedded in the lining. The balance system works by sending continuous electrical impulses to the brain. Moving the head causes the fluid in the semicircular canals to shift. This in turn changes the electrical impulses to the brain, allowing it to make any adjustments the body needs for balance. Bringing it all together, a sound wave is created external to the body. This is received at the outer ear where it hits the tympanic membrane. This causes the ossicle bones to vibrate, which in turn creates a piston action, creating a wave in the fluid of the inner ear. The fluid wave stimulates the hair cells in the cochlea, and an electrical impulse is sent through the eighth cranial nerve to the brain, the auditory nerve. This nerve carries both balance and hearing information. Alongside it runs the seventh cranial nerve, known as the facial nerve, as it supplies nerve impulses to the muscles of the face. That's all from me. Thank you very much for watching.